I'm here to say the opposite. I think if you want to change the world, you've got to get closer to the parts of this community where there's suffering and poverty. And Welcome to Black Nouveau. This is our edition for March 23rd, 2016. I'm Joanne Williams. Felix Mantilla played second base for the 1957 world champion Milwaukee Braves. In 1973, he started the Felix Mantilla Little League, still going strong today. He's here to tell us about a cultural exchange with Puerto Rico. Superintendent Darian Driver will join us for an update on MPS, and we'll take a twirl around the floor at the annual Daddy-Daughter Dance. You know, the Equal Justice Initiative was founded by lawyer and author Brian Stevenson. He advocates for the poor and the underserved in our nation's criminal justice system. He spoke recently at MATC. James Causey was there. All of my clients are broken people. They've been broken by abuse and neglect and poverty and racism and despair and addiction and disability. I represent the broken. And then I realized that I work in a broken system of justice. Brian Stevenson asked the audience to help change the world by creating a different justice system. He has gained national acclaim for his work challenging bias against the poor and minorities in a criminal justice system. This country is a very different place than it was 40, 50 years ago. In 1972, we had 300,000 people in jails and prisons. Today, we have 2.3 million people in jails and prisons. The United States now has the highest rate of incarceration in the world. We've got 6 million people on probation or parole. There are 70 million Americans with criminal arrests, which means that when they try to get a job or try to get a loan, they're disfavored. The percentage of women going to prison has increased 640% in the last 20 years. 70% of these women are single parents with minor children, which means that when they go to jail or prison, their children get displaced, they get sent away. What was your message to the MATC audience? Well, I wanted to alert people to the challenges that we're facing in this nation, uh, how I believe mass incarceration uh, is a civil rights issue that requires the full engagement of people who believe in basic human rights and civil rights. Uh, but also, I, I wanted them to understand that there are solutions, that if we get closer to the people in the places where inequality is so evident, uh, if we change some of the narratives behind the policy decisions, I think we've been focused on uh, trying to get policymakers to make different decisions without attacking the underlying narratives that have given rise to the policy decisions that they make. We've been corrupted by the politics of fear and anger in this nation. Our politicians have been competing with who can be the toughest on crime. We've got to change that narrative. I talked to them about changing the narrative about race. We've got uh, a legacy of racial inequality that I think has meant that we are not free in America and we're not going to get free until we change that narrative. And then I wanted them to understand that you have to be hopeful. Uh, injustice prevails where hopelessness persists. And finally, I wanted them to appreciate that we can't make change in this country until we're willing to do things that are uncomfortable. I've never seen oppression in, I've never seen justice prevail, where people only did things that were convenient and comfortable. And most of us have been taught our whole lives, if there's a bad section of town, if there's a part of town where the schools aren't doing very well, if there are parts of town where there's a lot of drug addiction and abuse, if there are parts of town where there's abuse and neglect and violence, you should stay as far away from those parts of town as possible. I'm here to say the opposite. I think if you want to change the world, you've got to get closer to the parts of this community where there's suffering and poverty and abuse. Why do you say it's a civil rights issue? Well, uh, the Bureau of Justice now predicts that one in three black male babies born in this country is expected to go to jail or prison. That was not true in the 20th century. That was not true in the 19th century. Uh, the African American community is facing challenges that are not unlike the challenges that existed when a third of our population couldn't vote, or when a third of our population was subjected to the rigors of Jim Crow, uh, or when uh, a third of our population had to deal with the immediate proximate threat of lynching, uh, or when there was this era of enslavement. And I think that uh, the despair and the hopelessness uh, that you see in many poor minority communities, the presumption of dangerousness and guilt that follows black and brown people, that constrains the oppor opportunities for black and brown people, no matter how much education they get, no matter how much wealth they acquire, is a civil rights issue. We are not free. 
uh, and this nation has not met its obligations to equality and justice. And so in that respect, we all, black, white, brown, other, have an obligation to do more, to do better. And I think we've allowed uh, the politics of crime to desensitize us to the obligations of justice. Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We obviously don't believe that in America because we've tolerated a lot of injustice in our, civil, in our criminal justice system. You say in your book, the opposite of poverty is not wealth, it's justice. Can you explain? I think we talk too much about money in America. I think we are preoccupied with how to get money here and money there, and we've failed to appreciate that most of the poverty that we are trying to deal with is structural. Uh, the people who are poor have been poor for generations. They are poor because we've never uh, created the kind of access and opportunity uh, that our Constitution speaks of. And I think if we really want to end poverty, if we want to do something about poverty, we've got to make a deeper commitment to justice. We've got to help people recover from the legacy of lynching. We've got to help people recover uh, from all of the damage that was done uh, by this narrative of racial difference. We've got to help people recover from structures and systems that have kept them poor because of their locations, because of the way we uh, employ tax laws and other things. Uh, and that's why I think the opposite of poverty is, is justice. I think if we use a justice frame rather than a pure money frame, who has it, who does it, we'll get to something that is closer to equality. We'll continue our conversation with Brian Stevenson next week. We are joined now by MPS Superintendent, Dr. Darian Driver. Welcome back to Black Nouveau. Thank you. It feels good to be back. Well, I'm glad you agree that it's a good place to be. Yeah. Now, the last time you were here, we talked about a lot of different issues. But I want you to give yourself a report card since the last time we were here, which was almost a year ago. What do you give yourself? A, B, C, D, F? What do you think? Right now, I think we're still at a B. Uh, we have some things that we are still trying to work on. Uh, student proficiency rates aren't where they need to be yet. Uh, we can't stop until we're at 100%. Uh, but the one thing that really has worked in our favor is that we have a tremendous amount of community support. And our community is helping us uh, with the tools, the resources, uh, and even the uh, strategy uh, to help us really put programs in place that are going to help our young people. So I think we're constantly in a state of improvement. Uh, nowhere near where we need to be yet, so we're not at an A yet, uh, but I definitely think in terms of getting the right resources in place, uh, being very strategic uh, in terms of our big eight objectives and beginning to execute those, uh, we're at a B. Okay, what are the big eight? So, uh, these are our strategic objectives uh, aligned with our overarching goals of academic achievement, uh, family, community, and business engagement, and effective and efficient operations. And so, we've been working over the past year now. This time last year, we were having our community sessions, and the, the uh, strategies that we gleaned from our community are now being put into action. So, it's everything from reimagining our high schools, uh, re-envisioning our business partnerships, and, of course, most importantly, closing achievement gaps. So, you have all these things that you want to do, and all the people you want to work with to get them achieved. What's the number one thing you want to attack first? Most importantly for us, it really is educating the whole child. Uh, we have a number of strategies, K through 12, uh, everything from literacy across the curriculum, making sure that we're expanding our AP courses. But when we're talking about the experiences that our young people are bringing with them to school every day, uh, we really are talking about trauma-informed care, uh, making sure that we're focusing on social emotional learning. Uh, we had our first wide uh, trauma-sensitive training as a district uh, for all of our schools uh, back in January. And so now they're going through 12 different modules. Uh, to help our teachers and our staff learn more uh, about what trauma is, how our young people experience it, and then how they can solve uh, those challenges for them. Uh, really making sure that all of our students are participating in anti-bullying efforts. Uh, so we have curriculum like Second Step, uh, but it's also around uh, peer groups working together and making sure that our young people know how to resolve conflict in a way that is healthy. Well, we've talked about the, the things that interact with children outside schools for years and years. So what's new about the approach you're trying to take? At this point, we have, I would say, rooted partnerships. So when we talk about reimagining high schools, we had 60 business, community, parents, students, uh, staff come to Chicago for three days last summer to focus on if we could reinvent our high schools, what would they look like? And so when you have uh, meaningful partnerships that are, are rooted down on core strategies, and it isn't just talk, uh, but there's actual action tied to it, so uh, whether it's internships, uh, whether rewriting our, our programs and our curriculum, and, and multiple 
multiple agencies uh, that are tied to the schools in meaningful ways, I think, makes all of the difference. There's the true investment uh, that's being felt from the community and making sure that our young people are successful. Uh, businesses are tied to schools. So a good example of that, uh, our, we're relaunching our um, culinary arts program uh, in partnership with the Wisconsin Restaurant Association and Bartolotta's and Surge Group. And so they have, they're piloting in four schools now, um, a culinary arts program, and uh, they have stepped up to lead this effort in partnership with the district. And I, I think that really does make a difference when people are invested on the front end, the communities had input. Well, it sounds like you have a lot of people working in your village. You referred to it as a village uh, last time we talked to and talked about prioritizing your partnerships. Uh, but is any of this information getting out to parents, to people who aren't associated with MPS? Does the rest of Milwaukee know what you're doing? So if you were to ask me about the report card in terms of our progress we're making, I think a B, but in terms of messaging, we're still at a C plus. We're trying very hard uh, to get the word out. Uh, we've changed a lot of our marketing materials, taking advantage of billboards, radio, conversations and opportunities like this. Uh, but there's so many important messages to get out to the community and we're still um, not reaching everyone. But part of that is because we have a community that for such a long time um, has embraced the negativity uh, that has been said about the school district. And so for every positive thing that we're able to get out, there's at least three other things that are negative. And so when you're constantly working against those odds, uh, it's difficult to get out the good news um, and even some of the not so good news, but to convince everyone that we still are making progress. Well, when you talk about getting the, the message out, uh, what what do you say when you talk to businesses who who will come back at you and say, well, you know, the reading scores aren't that great and, and you, the graduation rates aren't as high as we'd like to see? How do you convince them that things are getting better? Well, part of that is really emphasizing that high schools are a priority for us, uh, that we're redesigning our curriculum so that college and career are not an either or, but it really is two sides of the same continuum. Uh, GE Foundation has just launched a workplace curriculum uh, that we're starting as early as freshman year to make sure that we're reinforcing a lot of the soft skills that our businesses are looking for. But with our young people, uh, we're partnering with the Bucks to help us with attendance to make sure that our young people are in school every day. Uh, attendance is up 0.3%, which may not sound a lot, but we're over 90% now. And so continuing to make that progress. I think also the fact that we're teaching literacy across the curriculum. So we're well aware that our proficiency rates in reading aren't where they need to be, but students have multiple opportunities throughout the day uh, to catch up and to make sure that their reading skills are where they need to be. And I think last but not least, you know, when we, we do a lot of tours now in our high schools and we're bringing our partners to our schools so they can see firsthand the intelligence that our young people have, the enthusiasm that they have, and, and truly the desire that they have to succeed. And, and once they make those connections, it changes the conversation around what's possible for our young people and what's happening in MPS. Well, let's talk about changing the conversation, which came up when the legislature started the Opportunity Schools and Partnership Program. And uh, Superintendent Damon Means of the mequon Thienesville District is the, the chair of that. What is that exactly? And has anything come out of it yet? Uh, so at present, uh, nothing has come out yet. Uh, and basically what it is is schools that uh, fall into a certain criteria in terms of performance on the state report card and uh, capacity and, or how full their buildings are, um, they would be eligible for this program. Uh, so at present, uh, we had 53 schools that on the state report card from two years ago uh, were failing to meet expectations, which would possibly be eligible for this program. And, and basically, uh, the commissioner would be have full oversight uh, of these schools and attempt to do some type of a program that would help improve student achievement. But you know, some people said it's an attempt to take over MPS. Mm -hmm. Is it? Do you see it that way? I don't know that takeover is the word as much as it is all of these different efforts that are pulling away uh, from the district. And so uh, at the first year, it's, you're talking about one to three schools. Um, the way that I see it is much more that resources are being used uh, to pull away, uh, are being taken away from the district. So in terms, of maybe not take over, but take away. Uh, so really pulling resources away, um, energy going into trying to do something different instead of trying to put more emphasis into what is working well uh, and making sure that across the district we're able to have success. So are you working at cross purposes? Help, can you? Well, are you working together or are you working for the same outcome 
from different directions? I think everyone has in mind, you know, wanting to make sure that our young people are successful. That's the ultimate goal for this. Uh, of course, there have been conversations and things of that nature, but I do think in terms of, you know, coming from it from different directions, just by the way that, by design, uh, is how it's being outlined, but there's no question in my mind um, that superintendent means is trying to make sure that our young people have every chance to be successful. Um, I firmly believe that. Okay, we gave yourself a B. Next time you're here, let's see what grade you're going to give to you and MPS. Thanks for coming. Okay, thank you. Well, sports and baseball, it's a matter of confidence. It's, it's a matter of, of blocking out the negatives. And, and in a team structure, you're working for the same goal. It, it gives them social skills. They're meeting kids for the first time. They're learning how to make friends. They find out about themselves. They learn about victory and defeat. They learn that if you lose, you don't give up. We come back tomorrow, we practice again, and we go out there again. You go to bat, you make it out, that's okay. Come back the next time. Uh, still, it's, it's hard for the kid uh, to understand the game at the beginning. But the more that he works with the coaches and the coaches work with this particular uh, guy, he keep on learning and learning and learning. This summer, students from the Felix Mentia Little League will travel to Puerto Rico to play in a tournament with local athletes. And next year, players from Puerto Rico will visit Milwaukee. We are joined now by baseball great Felix Mentia and Charles Brown, director of youth athletics program at the Journey House. Thanks for joining us. Thanks Thank you. for having us. Mr. Mentia, um, tell me why you started the Little League in 1973. Well, uh, a friend of mine uh, from Puerto Rico gave me the idea and then I was thinking, because I played uh, in the police uh, athletic league in Puerto Rico, I thought it was a great idea because uh, you can help uh, a lot of the kids. And uh, we started in 1972 or 73. And it's been great uh, from there to this particular time. Uh, Charles, what's, what's the bond with the Journey House? Journey House uh, is a Southside community-based organization, and we have responsibility, administrative responsibility for Felix Mantilla Baseball League. We just took it over last year in 2015, and uh, we have responsibility for it right now. How many students are involved? Last year we had 165 players. Okay, okay. Um, can you talk about the holistic benefits of baseball? Absolutely. So we believe that Baseball is a vehicle to a higher goal, and our emphasis is on education and life skills, nutrition, parent engagement, appearance, how do we look, how do we behave, and at the end of that, it would be winning. Um, what prompted the change, either one of you can answer this, to, uh, the exchange with Puerto Rico? Well, uh, Mr. Mantilla and his um, family and associates uh, thought that we would want to grow the league and, and give our kids some extra exposure uh, by having a cultural exchange down to Puerto Rico where Mr. Mantilla is from. And so um, with his family and some associates, we thought we'd have this cultural exchange, uh, give our kids some great exposure of traveling outside the country and, and, and playing international kids. And then having those kids come to Milwaukee next year and do the, do the same thing. How is this going to be paid for? Uh, we're doing a, some fundraising through the associates of Mr. Mantia and his family. Uh, we're, we'll have a fundraiser, a dinner fundraiser, on the 2nd of April at Marquette University High School. Um, people can get in touch with Journey House uh, to find out more information about that. So it's being raised through donations from individuals, foundations, and uh, the fundraiser that we're having on the second. How can they get information on that? Do they go to your website? You can go to our website. Uh, they can call Journey House. We're www.journeyhouse.org. Um, our phone number is 414-647-0548. Uh, my extension happens to be 130. Okay, Mr. Mantia, you played baseball for over two decades, um, and you played in the World Series. Can you tell me about one of your greatest baseball moments? Well, there's been a few, but I think uh, the one that I remember the most is the uh, 1957 World Series. Or before that, when we clinched the pennant here in Milwaukee with Hank Aaron, 
hit a home run. Uh, we beat St. Louis there. And then we went to the World Series and beat the Yankees in seven games. Fantastic. You played second base at the time? Well, I, at the time I was playing short and uh, I played second, played left, center, and right. But mostly at second base. So. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you. And, and we'll go to the Journey House website to find out more about this. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I like that red jacket. For many of the dads and daughters in the city of Milwaukee, Valentine's Day is best celebrated at North Division High School. Oh! Got the most we've ever had. As you can see, the families, our uh, dads and daughters are excited about tonight, so we're excited for them. But this year, you know, three weeks in, we were already, you know, all the tickets were gone. This ticket has become one of the hottest tickets in town. The partnership between Milwaukee Public Schools, the Social Development Commission, and the Milwaukee Fatherhood Initiative has made it the hottest ticket in town because... And we want to give dads and daughters the opportunity to spend some time together, some quality time in a venue where they can have an intimate dinner, they can dance and have fun. And to be able to do this for so many men and for our city, for our community, uh, you know, that's what it's about, just really making sure that we're showing that we're focused on the importance of the role that fathers play. The first time we came, uh, you were two or three, perhaps two maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't remember. Yeah. Uh, we came a couple times, a very small event, uh, but we started coming back the last few years where it's just grown exponentially. The daddy-daughter dance growth was important to Dennis because of what he believes the responsibility of a man is to his daughter. It's my job as a father, you know, to make sure that my daughter understands that she has a man in her life who loves her, who respects her. And you know, we want to make sure that all young women understand that. So you're going to see a lot of um, men just really overwhelmed with joy when it comes to this interaction with, with their daughters. You know, moms, majority of the time, they're always with the daughters. But the dad gets a chance to say, here, here's two and a half hours or so for just you and I. We dress up, we have dinner, we dance, we have fun. So it's, it's really a chance to help build a relationship. And this is a chance that father gets to show a daughter what their first date should be like. It's important to me because I get to spend quality time with my daughter and then I also get to set the standard for any guy who's going to take her out on a date at some point when she's 25. Um, yeah. Quite a way. <laughs> right, right. So they, they, she knows how to be treated. We changed up the uh, format this year where we're having 600 dinner tickets, dinner and dance, and then we did 300 dance only. So right now people are taking pictures. Then we also have our signature daddy-daughter dance, which is usually a half hour into the dance where the dads and the daughter have that special tender moment and they dance together. Even though things look calm and adorable, there's been a storm brewing all night. The girls won, the daughters won. Are you, you're the reigning champions. What are you going to do tonight? We go in again. She said with utmost confidence. Yeah, I mean, just like, like I don't have no move. Do we get, do we get a move? Diada wouldn't share her moves, but the daddy-daughter dance battle was on the horizon. That's our big uh, competition where the dads are on one side, the daughters on the other side, and they have a dance-off competition. We play the old school music for the dads and the young stuff for the girls. The reigning champion is the dads, but we like to let the girls think they won last year by default. Dads got too tired after three songs or so, but they won last year. But since we've been doing it for the, this will be the fourth year, the dads are winning two to one. Two or three times, and then we'll see who the winner is. You get it? And then it began. The dads kicked it off. What you say? But the daughters seemed unimpressed. Oh, you up, girl. Very unimpressed. The daughters hit the quan and weren't missing a step. Good job. 
Even the dads had to give it up. But it wasn't over. The dads wanted to watch them battle, almost more than battling. But in the end, the winner of the 13th annual Daddy Dark Dance Off is the Daddies! And of course, it has nothing to do with the fact that the dad's a judge. It has nothing to do with that. Even if you don't make it to the dance, Spend some time with your daughter. Teach them the things that you want them to know as they grow up as a man and show them how a real man treats a woman. Before we close tonight, we note the passing of former state legislator Tamara Grigsby. She was a social worker and university professor. She served in the legislature from 2005 to 2013, representing Milwaukee's 18th district. She was influential in setting up the State Department of Children and Families and fought for collective bargaining for public employees. She graduated from Madison Memorial High School and received a bachelor's degree from Howard University in Washington, D.C., and a master's degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She left us much too early at the age of 41. And that's our program for this week. For Black Nouveau, I'm Joanne Williams. Thanks for watching.